Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am made everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Some truths are so powerful about God that when we say, So be it, Lord, yet many wonder why the world is in such a mess and how God could let it be that way if he really loves us. People ask for a perfect world, and one day that is exactly what God will bring. The world will not stay as it is, for Jesus is coming to make things new. As believers, we can rejoice at this promise, for that day truly is coming.
you're making. That guy was just up here like two weeks ago. <laughs> so, talk to Ed. I'm sure it'll be happy to put more people in the rotation. <laughs> One of the uh, neat things about working back at the AV booth is uh, we kind of get a little behind the scenes action. We uh, see some of the details that not a lot of people get to see about the service. One of them being is the time it takes for some of these to happen. And uh, one of the, move that before I trip on that, don't worry, don't One of the tiny things is on average, from the time the speaker for community meditation says their prayer and sits down, the time the prayer service starts is usually between 90 seconds and two minutes. By that time, people pick up their communion cups, and you hear everybody <laughs> crinkling with it, <laughs> trying to open it, take the communion, pray, do their time of communion, and then you know, it's time to do prayer and move on. So, what I'm going to ask everybody to go ahead and pick up your cup. Pick it up. Go ahead and open it up. <laughs> go ahead and open it up right now. Make as much noise, don't be discreet about it. it. It's hard to try to get in the right room for communion when you just spend 60 seconds. I don't have fingernails, so trying to get some of these open doesn't work for me. But trying to get a moment of self-meditation, communication, get in the right mindset with God can be hard when you're sitting there struggling, trying to get oil and plastic wrap off. At least it is for me. I don't know. Some of you might be a little better. I'm not asking you to do this with me, but I just want you guys to take a moment. Do this at your own pace. Just at your own, at your own time, at your own pace. Just remember what it is we're doing here. And he took the bread, broke it, gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you.
love the scripture that Regina put on the cover for today. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. What a wonderful way to stop. Start 2023. And the Lord gave me um, a scripture that was my mom's favorite. It's Isaiah 40, 31. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall not be weary. They shall mount up with wings um, as of eagles. They shall not be weary. And they, they shall walk and not be weary. I will get it out, Mom. <laughs> they shall run and not faint. That's another thing that I think we can expect in this new year. That God will be there to strengthen us, to guide us, and to protect us. Those are things that, as a body of Christ, we can expect from him. And we give him our faith, our love, and our devotion. Well, expectations for a new year. Those of you who make those dreaded I promise to's, uh, Good luck. I hope you keep them longer than two weeks. Um, New Year's resolutions just never worked. What I'm asking for are eyes to see and ears to hear. We are entering a time that's getting darker, and according to Isaiah, the light shall rise and shine. There's going to be a very distinct separation between light and dark, between God and the forces of evil. But I want to thank the praise teams for the Christmas music. It was absolutely marvelous, wasn't it? Should we give them a hand? Yes. Thank you. Thanks to Pastor Jim. I love learning more about the names of God. You need to keep on doing it every year. <laughs> give us more and more and more. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. It will be wonderful. Because they're endless. They're just absolutely marvelous. Baby Brooks Bryant is home. Judy's sister Edna is back in the nursing home. The new curriculum in Awana. We ask for faith guidance and blessings for our new year on our curriculum. Um, we just thank God for watching over Military families, the elderly in nursing homes, protecting the homeless, the throwaways, the runaways, and all of those that kind of fall between the cracks. God is faithful. He always is. <laughs> Any other praises to add to today? Other than happy new year? Yes, sir. Yeah. Congratulations. Country of Western fans. That's <laughs> good family. All right. Any other phrases? All right. Um, prayers. For the Jesse Owens family, when his wife Nancy passed, Kenny Crasher, he has an appointment on the 3rd hear about his biopsy results and you'll let us know. He is back in the hospital as of Thursday morning. Uh, some breathing problems. He did take a large amount of fluid off his lungs, but he went out. Alright. And he is in the hospital. Why don't we play that 
have a short ride. You'll get out of two. Uh, Frida Pease, she had a fractured vertebra and flu. She's in therapy, but Denny, who got the announcement about uh, sending in cards and <coughs> coming to visit, and um, Carol Isaacs. <laughs> Any more there? No, I haven't heard it yet. Okay. But your sis is doing great. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It must feel wonderful to take your breath and have your lungs fill and just feel that freedom. We just don't know what a blessing it is to take a breath. As um, Pastor Jim taught us, you pay by. We breathe him in and we breathe out his life. Yes. Go back to Denny for just a second. Yes. I'm glad you go over to see him on Friday. I can take two people with me. So if anybody wants to ride along, let me know. All right. You got to.
been in Hayworth. Hayworth, okay. All right. Any others? Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just give you praise and thanksgiving. What an honor, what a privilege it is to be able to come before your throne of grace to make our petitions known. You have ears that are always open to our prayers. You have hands that are always open to give us answers. Your mouth speaks into our heart with wisdom, and guidance, and in comfort. You, O oh Lord, are King of kings, Lord of lords, Father of the Lord. Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. We can come to you for comfort when we are hurting. We can come to you for answers when we are searching. We can come to you for deliverance when we are captive. We can come to you. We can always come. Help us to remember to come to you in thanksgiving, to come to you in praise, to come to you in joy, rejoicing over and over and over who you are and who we are in you. But for these that have been lifted up, we praise you for answers. We thank you for little Wayne. There needs to be another country of Western singer. In our midst, and I know how delighted that Brandy is to have that comfort of family. And I thank you, Father, for being with those who have lost loved ones, for the Owens family, for the, the favors that touch her. Lord, that you will release Diane from this influenza. For Ted Reed and his family. He's with you, Father. The, the family needs your comfort and your peace. We thank you, Father, for being with Kenny Thrasher. We thank you for Dennis' faithfulness to his brother. And we thank you, Father, for the new curriculum, for all that Faith has planned. Just guide her, Father, and comfort her. And give her the wisdom she needs. We thank you, Lord, for guiding Pastor Jim for this next year. All the sermons that he is preparing, all the things he's going to learn, all the times of sharing he's going to have with you. That is such a blessing for us as a congregation. And we thank you for him, for his family. We thank you, Father, for all of those who come forth to serve, who step up to fill in the gaps, who choose to become deacons and deaconesses and elders, hospitality, greeters, teachers, those who gather together in prayer, those who strengthen each other. And we just ask that you would continue, that you would comfort Logan and the whole Neck family, that you would be with little William and the loss of his grandmother. And we thank you, Father, for Dawn. She will have a successful heart surgery. And we thank you for safe travels for Jeff and Connie's family. We just thank you, Lord, that you are always, always worthy of our praise, of our thanksgiving. Help us to remember in this new year to give you glory each and every day. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hands to help, and feet to move. We are your eyes, your ears, your hands, your feet. And may we speak your comfort, your love, your truth to a struggle. We 
ask for your blessing upon our body. And may we grow, Lord, in wisdom and admonition. May we grow closer together in you. It is in your name, sweet Jesus, I pray. And we all give you praise and thanksgiving. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Messiah. Amen. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So here we are, the beginning of another year. If you have your Bibles with you, Go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 9, which is where we're going to be at this morning. Uh, this has become, this is now the third time I've done this, this has become one of my favorite Sundays of the year. Uh, not your typical sermon, uh, but a preview of where we're going to go in God's Word over the next 53 Sundays. And yes, you heard that right. <laughs> 2023 is one of those odd years where we have 53 Sundays. So if you look at it that way, we get one extra opportunity to be able to gather together and worship together and uh, celebrate together and do life together. Now I want you to look around you. Uh, in this room, there are chairs. Lots of them. Nice, soft, padded ones. Not the hard pews I grew up with, and maybe you did too. Now, up until John and Connie and the guys here at church expanded out our sound booth, which they did a fantastic job on, there were 270 chairs in here. Well, we lost 15 of them due to the sound booth. So that drops us down to 255. And we know nobody's ever going to sit in the front row. I mean, that's just never going to happen. So you can knock out about another 12. So let's say 240. Just nice round number. 240 chairs. Now, when I counted this morning, there were 96 people in this room. Or 98 people in this room. So there are some empty chairs. So say 240 chairs. 240 opportunities on a weekly basis to learn about Jesus. So ask yourself this question. One, which chair is mine? And am I going to commit myself to being in that chair for the next 52 Sundays? If at all possible. Now we know things happen. And we also know that we don't have assigned seats. In fact, sometimes you all move and it just freaks me out. Because you go from sitting on this side to this side, and sometimes it's just hard for me to wrap my head around. But we're welcoming, so if somebody comes in and sits in our chair, we're not going to get bent out of shape about it. So 200, 240 opportunities to learn about Jesus. Which one is yours, and which one is for your friend? Maybe that friend is somebody that's been part of the Lane Church, but hasn't been here for a while. They've been gone a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of months, or maybe it's one of those hangovers from COVID and they haven't been here in a couple of years. Have you talked to them? Have you reached out to them? Or maybe that chair is designed for somebody that has never walked through our doors before. Never been here. You know, there are things that we can do to reach out. And I'll do one plug here. How many of you have one of these? I haven't made this plug for a while, so I'm going to make it again. If you have a smartphone, and if you are on Facebook, please check in when you get here. Why? Because it does really cool things with Facebook's algorithms, and it pulls our page to the top on certain things. <clears throat> we used to be really good about it, and we kind of waned in the last couple of years. And so if you are on Facebook, please... Sometime while you're here, check in. Now, I have the best seat in the house. I know if you're scrolling Facebook, there's a big difference between looking at the Bible on your phone and scrolling Facebook. But please, check in and feel free to tweet the good stuff. You see something up on the screen that strikes you and you want to share it? Take a picture and post it during the middle of the sermon. You're not going to hurt my feelings. 
feelings. Because it gets the word of God out there. We all have a role to play. It comes down to each of us as individuals, because as we work as individuals and as we share as individuals, we are working together as a group. Now the fact of the matter is, when people come through these doors and they sit in here, the issue isn't the number of people in the chairs. The issue is, is our lives change when they walk out that door. That is the key issue. There are some Sundays you may get up in the morning and go, man, I really just don't want to go. You ever been there? I have, and I'm the preacher. It's like, do I really got to go? Yeah, honey, you got to go. You're the preacher. We all have those times. Maybe going that Sunday, maybe it isn't for you. Maybe it's for somebody else that is there. You ever have a Sunday where you walked out like, man, I didn't get much out of that this morning? Well, you may not have, but maybe somebody else did. And maybe your presence there impacted somebody else in a way that you will never know about. That which happens in the spiritual world is not often seen, but the impact of it readily is. And so as we go through this year, our theme for this year is the theme that's at the center of it all, the kingdom of God. When you look at the, at the words of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, it's everything from preparing for the kingdom, the inauguration of the kingdom, and life in the kingdom. But how do you define the kingdom of God? That thing which Jesus came to establish. John, the forerunner of Jesus, the voice crying in the wilderness, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That Jesus died the day the revolution began, the kingdom of God inaugurated. That kingdom of God, that body of Christ, how does it work? The best definition that I have ever heard to explain the kingdom of God came from George Ellen Ladd, simply this. The kingdom of God is already not yet. Want to scratch your head on that one for just a second? Already not yet. Already here, inaugurated when Jesus died. Everybody can now be a part. Everybody now has a seat at the table. But not yet because it has not reached its fullest picture. It's not complete yet. That comes on the other side of eternity. And our goal is to not only get ourselves there, but get as many other people there as possible. And so this year we're going to look at the kingdom of God. And we are going to do it by looking at the Old Testament. And we are going to do it by looking at the New Testament. I'm actually really excited about the things that we're going to look at. Uh, but we're going to do a few things different, you know, as, as things go uh, with the church. Uh, times change, things change, methodologies change. Uh, I, I learned that reading the Word of God, the number one thing in reading the Word of God is humility. Because I don't have all the answers. We serve the one who does, but I don't have all the answers. Man, I try to give you the best information I can. But even I occasionally have to look back at something and go, you missed it. Or if you come up to, you, to me and ask me a question, I may look at you and go, that's a great question. Ain't got a clue. I'll try to find out for you. I'll do the best that I can, but I don't have all the answers. So when it comes to studying scripture, the key to it is humility. And then the second to that is context. Read scripture initially how it was written, who it was written to, and why it was written to them. You can draw your application later. That's the beginning. And then, you have scripture on one side, and then what falls off of that is ministry, is derived from it. The key to scripture, humility. The key to ministry, flexibility. I have written in my Bible, in every Bible that I have had since I was in college, a statement that Bob Stacy, and some of you may know him, if you have ever been to CIY, he's the guy that started it all. And I happen to be blessed to have him as a family group leader my freshman year of college. 
He made a statement. I love it so much. I scribbled it down in my Bible. It fits on. It fits along in the Beatitudes. Honestly, I wish Jesus would have said it. Maybe in context, he did somewhere, and it was simply this: "Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape." <laughs> Good words to live by. Right in every Bible I've had since that time. We work together. We pull together. We make a change. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Always room for reevaluation. That is called doing life together. Yeah, we're making some changes in our children's ministry. You know what? I'm making some changes too. You may see some changes in my presentation of my sermons over the course of the next year. Every year I try to read at least two or three books on preaching just to keep myself fresh. Sometimes I read those books and go, that's really great. Sometimes I read those books and go, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And sometimes they're somewhere in between. But, you know, I'm also one. I'm, I'm, I'm free to take a couple of shots even at myself on occasion. Uh, maybe I'm showing my age by this. Uh, I did grow up watching some reruns. I'm not quite this old, but I think everybody knows who George Burns and Gracie Allen are. All right. George Burns. His comments on preaching. The secret to a good sermon is to have a good beginning and a good ending. Then to have the two as close together as possible. <laughs> you ever feel that way? Sometimes I feel that way. Sometimes the text can just get away from you. Or you write a sermon, and man, that looks really good on paper, and then you get to preach and go, I should have wrote this to about three weeks. It happens sometimes. So, we do life together, we reevaluate, and we move forward. The goal of the church. Proclaiming the king and expanding the kingdom. That's really what it boils down to. Or as uh, it has been said so eloquently by the man's name, who I cannot remember at the moment. Oh, Oswald Smith. There we go. It hit me. The spring task of the church is the evangelization of the world. And after the church is established and people are evangelized, that is, we tell them about Jesus. We preach the gospel, they accept the gospel, then it becomes about discipleship. Disciple making is evangelism. Discipleship is growth in Christ. So now to our key text for this morning. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And if you happen to be following along one of the sanctuary Bibles, it's page 866. And since this is the first Sunday of the year, we're going to make the announcement that we make every once in a while. If you're here this morning you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the seat back in front of you. Take that Bible, write your name in it, take it home with you and use it. Bring it back with you every Sunday when you come to church. <coughs> write in it, take notes in it. And when we are up here and we are going through God's Word, digging into God's Word, we'll give the page numbers so you can follow along and find it easily. Because I'll be honest. I grew up in the church, and I still sometimes have a hard time finding that passage of Scripture when the preacher gives it. So Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal I chose that passage because of its twofold importance. The spiritual and the physical. He sent them out with authority to deal with both. The ability to deal with both. It's the same here. Our primary obligation to the world around us is to preach the gospel. Our primary responsibility is the spiritual. But that is not to be divorced in any way from the physical. Because in many ways, meaning the physical means that people have. And guys, we live in a world that's needy. A world that is more broken and more needy than I've ever seen it in my entire life. And the opportunities are tremendous. 
to be able to reach out. Because oftentimes in meeting the physical needs of people, and remember that should never ever replace the spiritual side of it, but oftentimes in meeting those physical needs, we are given the opportunity to meet those spiritual needs. Or as uh, Albert Schweitzer put it in his book, The Mystery of the Kingdom of God, there can be no kingdom of God in the world without the kingdom of God in our hearts. That is, that the message of the kingdom, that is the gospel, takes so hold of us and is so rooted within us that it pours out of us into the world. More than once in his letters that we find towards the end of our Bible, the Apostle Paul talks about the gospel and he identifies it as my gospel. Not that it originated with him. Not that he created it. Not that he determined what it was or that he had any influence over it at all. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It is the gospel having so much influence over him that he can't help but preach the gospel. That is the way the kingdom of God works. The kingdom of God exists within us. We are part of it. If you are a believer in Jesus, if you are a saved, justified, sanctified believer in Jesus, you are a part of the kingdom of God. When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, and we talk about God's kingdom coming, already here, but not yet. It's here, it's working, it's growing, but it hasn't reached its ultimate fulfillment yet. That will come and we have a role to play in that coming. The gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth, and then the end will come. As scripture says. So how do we do it? So anyway, this lays the groundwork for what we're going to be looking at this year. The first sermon series that we're going to do this year, and I always try to begin the year with an evangelistic series, Evangelism, discipleship, what are you going to do with Jesus? Those two questions we ask at the end of the service. So the first series is reaching out. It's a group effort, but also, as you can see in the colors, I go. It's personal. It has to be personal. Now the world has told us that if you're a Christian, it's personal, shut up and keep it to yourself. Baloney. We were never called to keep it to ourselves. Yes, there's a personal aspect of faith. There's a personal aspect of sitting down and pulling out the Bible and studying and meditating and praying. That's the personal aspect. But our faith was never meant to be lived behind closed doors. Our faith is meant to be lived in the public square here on Sunday mornings and out in the world as we go, day in, day out, living it out. So we go. <clears throat> and over the course of this series, we will be looking at the Great Commission. The Great Commission is given to us in every one of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, plus the book of Acts. We're going to be looking at the first four of them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because each one of them was written to a different audience for a different purpose. And when taken all together, it gives us an all-encompassing picture of why we are here, where we are going, what we are doing, and why it matters. And so here's the key thought for that series. When ordinary people reach out and help others become faithful followers of Jesus, lives will be changed. And our chaotic world will be transformed. Does that statement at all sound familiar to you? It probably should because it's derived straight from our identity. How we define, how we define who we are as a body of believers. Ordinary people helping each other become faithful followers of Jesus. 
It's on our print material. It's on our sign. My hope is, is that it's burned into our hearts <coughs> and who we are. So that changes the world. So we begin with this series on global outreach, which begins at home. And then the second series that we will have will take us into the Easter season. Voices from the Passion. I remember, as a Bible college student, the life of Christ was broke down into three classes. Three, three-hour classes, which meant they met four days a week for an entire semester. Life of Christ 1 and Life of Christ 2, I got it. It made sense to me. There's a lot of material to cover there. But we got into Life of Christ 3, the last week of Jesus' life. An hour a day, four days a week for an entire semester. <clears throat> it's a week. How in the world are we going to spend that much time on a week? We barely got through it. There was so much there. Why? Because so much happened in that last week of Jesus' life. The death of Jesus is the axis on which all world history turns. And the fall from that is simply this. When Jesus died, he didn't die alone. Numerous witnesses were present very first-hand testimony that speaks to us of God's grand story of redemption. So we're going to look at the people that figure into that story. Some of them are well known and get a lot of get a lot of ink. And some of them barely get a mention. But all of them play into the story. All of them have a part to play in a perspective that shows us that not only is the kingdom for everybody, but that everybody needs to be for the kingdom. <coughs> Once we get past that, we get to jump back into the Old Testament. And I get to do something that I wanted to do here a couple years ago. Here a couple years ago, I preached a short series <coughs> in the book of Daniel. And I was very irritated at myself that when I laid things out, I didn't just say, we're going to clear the schedule and we're going to spend quite a while here because we need to. And I said I'd come back to it, so now we're coming back to it. This series entitled Fangs and Flames. From, of course, probably the two most famous stories in the book of Daniel. Daniel and the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Oh, those are great stories, but there's so much more there. So much more there. A nation in exile, a nation that feels rejected. Yet God says, don't lose heart. I have a plan. I have a plan for you. And we're going to look at the whole book. A lot of times when people preach the book of Daniel, they do all the cool, fun stories like Daniel in the lion's den and the fiery furnace. And then they stop. Because there's some things that show up at the end of the book of Daniel that just kind of make us scratch our head and go, what? It's those weird things in Scripture. Those prophetic things that talk about Jesus that's going to come. And the end of the world. But the crazy part is, is that when you read prophecy, and we'll deal with the prophecy stuff, you know what the key concept in prophecy is? Anybody want to take a guess? Be ready. That's what it boils down to. Oh, there's a lot of crazy stuff that we can look at. How do we determine what is figurative language and what is literal language? Yeah, we'll dig into it. We'll try to work our ways through it. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to the simple fact of be ready. And what we can look at from this is simply this. The opposite of courage is not cowardice but conformity. It's the jailer of freedom and the enemy of transformation. Godly courage allows us to stand strong in a shattered world. When I preached through the early part of Daniel, the last time the focus of it was thriving in Babylon. Well, that is still there. 
You look at Babylon and how Babylon existed in the day of Daniel and look at our world today. The parallels are striking. And so we're going to dig through the book of Daniel and spend quite a few weeks there. And then the next one was something that's been playing around in my head for probably five or six years. That can be a dangerous thing. <laughs> I've told you all in here before that it's a good thing you can't see inside my head. It's a scary place for me sometimes, and I can only imagine what it'd be for you guys. But this has been rolling around in my head. The two trees. And the graphic up there tells a story. The people. Do you see them in the trees? Do you see the people? The arms going out and the heads on each side? Here's a story. And it's simply this. And it comes to our key thought through the series. The story of Scripture is a full circle journey. That is by taking us back to the beginning. A tree growing in paradise and a choice that we're required to make. In Genesis, there is a tree in the garden. A tree of life. That Adam and Eve were free to eat of. A tree that gives life. And then we go to the book of Revelation. And there's that tree. The new heaven and the new earth. Heaven meets earth. The universe has been renovated. All that was turned upside down and created at the fall has been reinstated and put back correct. And there's that tree again. What's its purpose? Well, we read in Genesis, Adam and Eve are booted out of paradise. And the angel with the flaming sword one of my favorite characters in the Bible, the angel with the flaming sword. You want to know why? The first play I was ever in in church. I was the angel with the flaming sword. I didn't have a single word. I stood there with the sword. That's all I did. But it had a purpose. To block them from the tree of life. And then at the end, there's that tree again. Freely to be obtained. And why were they blocked from the tree? Oh, there was another tree in that garden. A tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't touch it. Don't eat from it. You're going to die. They didn't believe God. They didn't take God in his word. They thought God was holding out on them. You know the crazy thing about that tree of knowledge of good and evil? God said, don't touch it. You notice what God didn't say? God didn't say, don't ever touch it. They put the cart before the horse. I think it would have been something, at least my understanding of it, that would have been explained to them as time went along. But they got impatient. And they ate from that tree. And the answer to it was another tree. A tree that was grown to full maturity and then cut down and formed by a carpenter into a cross. And Jesus hung on that tree to take us back to the first one. So that's what we're going to look at there. The story of the two trees. Beginning to end, kingdom presented, kingdom laid out, kingdom come. And then when it goes to living in the kingdom, we're going to Look at the great epistle of freedom, the book of Galatians. This will be one of those book, chapter, verse series. We will look at every word in that book. Dig into it. What does it mean to be free? When all the craziness started here a couple of years ago with that pestilence that will remain nameless, we were going through the Ten Commandments. That was the series. I remember preaching that first sermon of the lockdown from my office. Felt super, super awkward. 
to preach on Saturday night in a room by myself to a tablet. Well, this is kind of a follow-up to that. Because as the Ten Commandments said Israel will free to live free, the blood of Jesus sets us free to live free. The gospel, Jesus died to save sinners. The gospel brings us confidence amid chaos, confidence amid controversy, and commitment amid conflict. Chaos, controversy, conflict. Sound like the world we're living in? Sure does. Galatians is all about freedom, about spiritual freedom. I would argue, and some of my preacher friends would disagree with me, and they're, you know, just fine, they can be wrong, <laughs> that Galatians is the greatest letter that Paul wrote. Oh, Romans is great, don't get me wrong. From a theological perspective, Romans is amazing. But I think when it comes down to the freedom that we have in Christ, Galatians is the greatest of his works. And then as we end the year, the past of Christmas present. Here a couple of weeks ago in Sunday school, I took our class through some of the messianic prophecies about Jesus. Now, depending on how you read something as a prophecy and how it fits, there are 140, 150 prophecies about Jesus, some of which have already been fulfilled, some of which have yet to be fulfilled. And for Jesus to have only fulfilled 10 of them, the odds would have been you know, one in ten to the seventeenth power. You know, put one out there and tack seventeen zeros on the end of it. Well, we're going to look at a few of them. What the Bible says about Jesus before Jesus. What the Bible says about the kingdom that he's going to inaugurate before he even gets here. But as we know, if we've been in church any amount of time... Jesus doesn't wait till the New Testament to show up. Oh, he shows up in the Old Testament. In fact, he's there in Genesis 1. In creation, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all three there. They're all three active. And Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the one that spoke it all into existence. And that he's there with us wherever we go. So the thought from this one is simply this. History is unrolled, is the unrolled scroll by the prophecy and makes for us an unparalleled portrait of the Messiah who came to save the world. Why Jesus came. So that's where we're going to go this year. I hope you're as excited as I am. If you have any questions about any of this, please feel free to ask beforehand. We'll still have our listing sheets in the bulletin. We still encourage the questions. But you know, even on a Sunday like this, where it's a preview, and not as it was put when I was in Bible college, three points in a poem. Actually, if you haven't noticed, kind of got away from the three-point sermons. But no matter how many points it has, there's always one underlying point, Old Testament or New Testament, and that is... Jesus. Abraham Kuyper was a Dutch theologian and politician. Two words that typically don't go together, but he was able to strike the balance. Probably one of the world's foremost theologians in the late 19th, early 20th century. And I love this, and I want to end with this. There is not a square inch of the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, Mine! Lecture he gave at Princeton Theological Seminary. Do we get it? Do we see it? And are we there to play our part? Jesus is sovereign over all. God is sovereign over all. 
but we have a role in play, to play in that evangelization of the world. Another one from Oswald Smith, the church that does not take seriously its call to evangelizing the world has forfeited its right to exist. If we lose that perspective, we might as well shut out the lights and go home because we become a social club, not a hospital, which is what we're supposed to be. So we come down here to the end of our time and ask the two questions that we ask every week. Question number one, what are you going to do with Jesus? That's the question of salvation. That is the ultimate question. Answer the story about Jesus and all the other questions in life fall into perspective. Praise team, if you want to go ahead and come back up. You answer that question, all the others fall in perspective. We may not get the answer we want. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is not right now. They don't always like that. But that's the way it works. Faith can be a struggle, but life is a struggle. That's why God gives us the gift of each other. Iron does sharpen iron. Sometimes we rub each other the wrong way. Sometimes we annoy each other. Sometimes we get flat out irritated with each other. I still remember the first Sunday I was here as your preacher. I know sometimes on this journey I'm going to tick you off. And that's okay because sometimes on, the, sometime on this journey you're going to tick me off. <laughs> But it's all good because we're adults and we love each other and we love Jesus and we're going to work our way through it. <coughs> that is the gift of each other, loving each other, praying for each other. The greatest thing that you guys, and I will put this out here, maybe a little longer invitation, but here it is. Pray for each other this year. Pray for individuals. Pray for a group. Pray for the youth group. Pray for the Sunday school classes. Pray for the children's ministry. Pray for our missionaries. I had a video update from Matt and Sid. Had a technical difficulty. We'll have it next week if I have to re-download it. But those that are scattered around the world, one of the greatest things we can do is pray for each other. If you're struggling, going into a new year, a year of beginnings, and maybe your last year stunk on ice. Maybe it was a gigantic dumpster fire. It's one of the reasons to be here. Oh, you may not get every answer you're looking for on day one. But they'll come. And you have the support system of your family. If you're here this morning and you're struggling, you can come down here. We can pray for you. We'd love to. You can grab one of us leaders. We can go back to the back and pray for you. You can pick, me, pick up the phone during the week. Hey, Jim, can I talk? Yeah, my door's open. And our elders the same way. And then the second question is, what are you going to do with Jesus? After you've accepted him, after he's Lord of your life, are you going to keep him to yourself? Pull him out when life gets tough? That's a horrible way to treat Jesus. Do you know that? It's a horrible way to treat him. Just kind of stick him in your pocket and pull him out when you need him. And he doesn't want to be an afterthought. He wants to be the thought. Because when we make him the thought, we get everything else that we need. When we make the kingdom of God the priority, everything that we need is going to be provided. Scripture tells so, excited for a new year? Maybe a little trepidation? That's healthy too. But if there's any needs this morning, anything at all, we invite you to come as we say this. <laughs>
especially, go ahead, reach out, grab hands with the person next to you, and we are going to ask God's blessing on our week. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're glad that you're here and hope that this time has been a blessing to you as your presence has been a blessing to us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just thank you for the beginning of another year, a beginning of another year of family and faith and fellowship in your name. What we do here in this place on Sunday morning, what takes place in this amazing facility that you have so richly blessed us with during the week, week in, week, week out, day in, day out, uh, the lives that are touched as we are here and the lives that are touched as we go out. God, this year we pray that you would put somebody in our path on a weekly basis, maybe even a daily basis. <coughs> Somebody that by our words and by our actions, we can point them to you. We have been blessed. May we take that blessing and use it to bless others. Father God, we thank you for the blessings of life. But most importantly, for your son Jesus for whom salvation is made available to all who would but believe. And it's in his powerful name we pray. Amen. 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 Have a great week, everybody.